All right, in this video, I want to make another, uh, show another example of what you can do with dependent data. So as a reminder, we have this made up example where I randomly selected 10 married couples, heterosexual married couples, and tracked how many books each husband read and how many books their wives read. So the first couple, husband read three books, wife read four books. Um, and what I wanted to do, what I did in the last video is I did hypothesis testing with that data. In this video, I'm gonna do make a confidence interval with that data. And when I say with that data, I don't really mean with these two columns of data, because as we saw, if you have dependent data, if these are married couples and not just 10 males and 10 completely unrelated females, if these are connected, dependent upon one or the other, then I can subtract them. I can forget about these two columns of data, instead focus on this column of data where I find the differences. This negative one is this three minus this four. This positive five is this 15 minus this 10 and so on. In the last example, we try to figure out if we can conclude that males read more than females. Maybe now I can say, create a, I don't know, let's go 99, sure, percent confidence interval for how many more books males read than females. Uh, not great English, but hopefully close enough that you can understand what's going on. The key thing here is we're making a confidence interval this time. And I don't think it'll surprise you to find out that what we're going to do is going to be pretty similar to what we did with hypothesis testing, where we only worry about L3, this difference column here. Um, but instead of doing a t-test, we're going to do a t-interval. So when we did high, uh, when we made confidence intervals in the past, it was a three-step process that sometimes had this additional fourth step. The first step, you would state the shape center and the spread of the distribution. Although, as I told you in the previous video, we're not gonna worry about shape, center, and spread anymore in this class. Um, the formulas get pretty difficult pretty quickly, and I don't want you spending your time there. You've already proven to me you can do that in chapter four. So we'll skip that step. So the first thing that we'll do down here is we'll just draw our picture. And when you're drawing the picture with confidence intervals, I always ask you to make sure to include three things. I want you to show me your point estimate, your level of certainty, and the bounds of your interval. So low-hanging fruit, probably the easiest of those things is your level of certainty. It's a 99% confidence interval. So I have a 99% level of certainty. So my picture looks kind of like this. What I need is my point estimate, the number that goes in the middle here, and the bounds of my interval. And none of those are obvious, but fortunately my calculator is gonna tell me all of that stuff. So what I wanna do, first make sure you got your data in here. I got the green data in L3. I want to hit the stack key, then go over to tests, and it's going to be a T interval. Same reason it's a T interval, uh, same logic as it was that made us choose T test as opposed to Z test is going to have us choose T interval as opposed to Z interval. Nowhere in the problem does it say anything about sigma, the population standard deviation. That's not known. The only standard deviation we get is the one our calculator is going to calculate from this sample data. When you don't have sigma and instead no s, it follows a t distribution, which is why we're going to use t interval here. And I could either do this with data or statistics. Right? I could give you the statistics. I could say you randomly selected 10 married couples and found that on average, the males read 1.8 books more than the females, and the standard deviation of the differences was 2.5. I could give you those numbers, in which case you'd have the statistics, you'd have x bar and s. Uh, but typically what I do is I give you the data instead. And so you got to give your calculator the data. And the data is in L3 because, again, it's the green data that I want to use here because I have dependent data. And then my level of certainty, which in this case we said was a 99% confidence interval. So you go down to calculate. And what you'll see is this not only gives the bounds of the interval, negative 1.867, and we'll talk about what that means. What do you mean negative? And a five point, a bunch of sixes. Uh, I guess I could round that to a seven in case anyone's picky. Uh, and then you're like, what about the point estimate? You never gave me that, right? The calculator calculates that for you here. That's what this X bar represents. This is saying that the average in this data, on average, males read 1.9 more books than females. The sample average difference was 1.9. It doesn't mean it's the population average difference, but that's my best guess for the population average difference. That's my point estimate. That 1.9 goes here. How my calculator created this is it started with the 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.
which is just the average of this green column if you did one variable statistics, and then it added to that number and subtracted from that number some amount, which is called the margin of error, by the way. And the way it figured out the margin of error was based on the spread, which was based on the standard deviation, which it calculated as well. Anyways, this is the picture that we need. Level of confidence, point estimate, bounds of the interval. So this will be the first step you'll do because you're not doing the shape center spread step. And then the next step, which is more important in this section than it's been in the past, is making your conclusion. Tell me, tell me what this means. And typically when I ask this on tests, I say, tell me what this means and be really clear that make clear that you understand what negative numbers represent in the context of this example. What do you mean negative 1.867? Well, as a reminder, where these numbers are coming from is this green data. And this green data is males minus females. So when you see positive numbers on the differences, that corresponds to a male reading more books than a female. And when you see negative numbers on this differences, that corresponds to the female reading more books than the male. So what I'm saying here is I want to be 99% sure of mu, the population average. If I took all the males and all the females, I guess maybe the married ones uh, in the world, and compared the males to the females, what would the difference be? How many more books would the male read than the female? And the answer is, well, my best guess would be 1.9. But I don't know for sure that that's the population average. That's just the sample average. In fact, if I want to be 99% sure about that difference, it has to span from negative 1.867. In other words, the wife reads 1.867 more books all the way up to the husband reading 5.667 more books. So we include this negative here, meaning I'm not even sure, I'm not even 99% sure that males read more books than females because zero is in this interval. I'm not even 99% sure of that. It's possible that the female reads more books than the male or the male reads more books than the female. What I could say is something like I am 99% sure or certain that the average number of books read by all males is between maybe 1.867, note not negative, but 1.867 less and 5.667 more than the average number read by all females. I guess I could have done a better job of stating that, uh, that the average numbers, how about the average number of books? read by all males is between 1.867 less, key less here because of this negative sign, and 5.667 more than the average number of books read by all females. Um, what if I, the student, just say, I'm 99% sure that the average number of books read by all males is between negative 1.867 and positive 5.667 more? Okay, it'd be hard for me to take off points if you did that, but I'd prefer you don't because I think saying negative 1.867 more is kind of counterintuitive. And even if you do know what that means, it's not clear to the greater or to me, I guess, that you do know what does it mean to be negative more? Well, it means less. But I think maybe writing 1.867 less might be more clear. Uh, maybe try to make your conclusion look as much like this as possible. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to try to be as reasonable as I can as you go through this stuff. One last comment here before I end this video. Remember, confidence intervals were always at least three steps, sometimes four. The first step was shape, center, spread. You're not worrying about that. The second step was the picture. The third step was the conclusion. And sometimes there's this fourth step where it said, oh, you're not happy with this confidence interval. You need a smaller margin of error. What would your sample size have to be? I don't remember if I talked about this in the T interval video, but the good news for you, the student, is that you never have to worry about that. And remember, I mean, maybe if this rings a bell, n equals z sub alpha over 2 divided by the margin of error times sigma squared. Maybe you remember this formula that you had to use to solve for n for a given margin of error? Well, since this is a t distribution, it wouldn't be z sub alpha over 2. It would be t sub alpha over 2. You'd have to use a t distribution and find the area that is so, or find the point that's so far to the right that the area to the right of it is only alpha divided by two. Yeah, I could do that. It'd be inverse norm. No, nah, because it's a t distribution, it wouldn't be inverse norm. It'd be inverse t. And because some of you don't have the inverse t function, I will never ask you to do this. 
So when you have a T interval, whether you're in 5.1 or 5.2, I will never have that fourth step that you saw back in chapter four, where you have to determine the sample size. So good news is you never have to worry about that. Uh, we'll only have the three step process and we'll always skip the first step in chapter five. So confidence intervals will boil down to this two step process. Really the challenge is remembering where to get your point estimate and being able to state a conclusion like this when one of the bounds of your interval is a negative number.